Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Um, today I would like to talk about examples of adjoint factors. So adjoint factors, one of the most important notion that you see in category theory, arguably, of course, what is most important anyway, but it's definitely one of those cornerstones of category theory, cornerstones of category theory, sounds very good, where um, people have discovered in this case, mostly uh, Dan Daniel Kant, Daniel Kant, Dan Kant, um, that adjoints occur almost everywhere. Kind of was built to the definition or the first uh, definition of adjoint factors was built on the observation that kind of a lot of things we have seen so far um, are adjoint factors. And there's this general theory, which nobody has seen. So it was the 60s of the last century. Um, and here you go, adjoint factors. And now just everything is just an adjoint factor. Well, so we will see today, I mean, just, this whole video is just dedicated for to examples for adjoint factors. So let's get going. So some examples, kind of the main example is probably the free uh, forget adjunction. So free and forget is kind of the nice adjunction pair. So forget is this easy functor that you have kind of sophisticated structure and you forget a little bit about it and you get a less sophisticated structure. And if this functor has a left adjoint, it's always a bit complicated, so the left adjoint then there's a free object of the corresponding type. Just think about vector spaces on one side and uh, set on the other. There's set, uh, this is my forget functor, and then there's a free functor going in the opposite direction. There's a free vector space. And what is a free vector space on a set? Well, it's really this easy idea that you have a set, which is something discrete, so it's a floating element somewhere, and you use them to define an appropriate coordinate system, right? So that's that's the free vector space. That's all there is. So informally, free means kind of generic, as generic as possible, satisfying only the necessary relations. That's how you define free, um, or that's how you think about free. And to define what it means to be free, you might want to take the approach that you have a forgetful functor, and if it exists, it should be the left adjoint to the forgetful functor. Uh, the example you should keep in mind are vector spaces. I will show you uh, ma many more on a later slide. A non-example are fields. So in this definition, free fields do not exist. So from the category of fields, you can still go with the forgetful factor to set, but there is no left adjoint. So uh, free field, hmm, God knows. Again, this is saying that the category of fields, it's a little bit of a fishy category. Uh, it's a bit complicated. We can't really do anything with it. It's kind of a little bit strange. So fields are kind of strange objects from that perspective. Anyway, the, the main player here is the free, free forget uh, adjunction, which is kind of the blueprint example of an adjoint functor anyway, but not the only one. So kind of a fun fact here is that you can use category theory to define new free objects nobody has seen before. Well, in some sense, of course, this example I'm showing you, you have seen it before, but maybe you wouldn't have called it co-free and free. Um, right, why not free and co-free? So if you have forget and it has actually a right adjoint, not just a left adjoint. Remember the left adjoint is a free object, but it might have a right adjoint. And then you could call it the co-free uh, functor. Co-free kind of a dual, right? So co, uh, everything turned around, why not? An example is a really cute example is a forgetful factor from topological spaces to set, so sets of course, which has two adjoints, one of them is left, one of them is right, and I hope I haven't messed up the order on this slide. So the left adjoint is, well, let's think about it. What could it be, right? So I think there should be two kind of natural ways or canonical ways to build uh, a topology on a space uh, by just saying that everything is open or only the minimal parts are open. So you can say you have a discrete topology or if indiscrete topology, and I probably just mixed up the words. Uh, so the discrete one, anyway, the discrete one is a free topology in the sense the discrete uh, is a left adjoint and the indiscrete is a right adjoint function. And I like this example so much because, well, we learn kind of very early on, well, maybe not very early on, but at one point in our mathematical lives, Probably we have seen the discrete and the indiscrete topology with kind of the canonical ways to associate, as I said, a topology to a set. And there's no really way to prefer one of the other. And in this setup, it really tells you, no, they're kind of dual to one another. One of them is a co-free construction. 
one of them is a free construct. This might happen. For vector spaces, it doesn't. There's only the left adjoint. Um, but here, here it's good. So here you have two different uh, left adjoint. It's not the same as the right adjoint. So the free topological space is not the same as the co-free topological space. And well, OK, what do you call free and co-free is a matter of wording anyway. But one of them is the indiscrete one, and one of them is a discrete one. And I probably mixed up the order yet again. I'm still ho very hopefully. Uh, I think this looks correct, but you should double check. It's not so not so hard to double check, right? But this is just another instance. Here comes a really cool one. It's called currying. It's very well known in mathematics, and I think the name comes from computer science. And this is kind of this funny idea. So you have a currying process, and you have an uncurring process. And if you have a, a function in a certain number of uh, uh, inputs. You can actually associate to, to it a function in a function in a function in a function in a function, depending on the number of inputs, kind of a very nice idea. And one of them might be easier in practice than the other, right? So you might not want the function in three inputs, but you might want this chain of functions. Yeah. So this one might be preferable. The other one might be preferable. Depends. So you can always curry and uncurry. I'm not quite sure which operation is called currying, which one is called uncurrying. I would guess right now that this is currying and this is uncurring. But it actually doesn't matter so much because it's a bijection, it's a bijective operation, which is pretty explicit actually. And it's based on uh, the following funny thing that the endofunctus uh, on set in this case, so the endofunctus on set, which is taking the cross product or taking the home, they form an adjoint pair. Uh, this is kind of the currying equation. So a function in two inputs is the same as this chain of functions. And you can do this with as many inputs as you want. So currying is actually a form of uh, adjoint pair. It's actually a form of a junction. Well, it's kind of cool. And these isomorphisms, as I said, are known. So this one here is known as currying or uncurring. I never remember which one is which, but it doesn't matter so much because they are kind of inverses of one another. Anyway, and it's just a matter of, of choice which one to call which. So this is pretty cool. So even something in computer science um, comes from adjoint pairs. And I just list a few more, so we will see lots of adjoint functors around. Uh, you see them. As, as soon as you know this definition, you see them all over the place. Uh, anyway, so the free forget the junction is kind of the main example you should keep in mind. I list a few here. So vector spaces set, monoid set, group set, uh, Z, uh, abelian group set, ring set, algebra set, for example. But you don't need to end in set, so this is kind of a funny one. There you can go from the category of categories to the category of curves, so diagrams in a precise sense. And there's a forgetful functor um, and has a, an adjoint. So actually, there's something like a free category, which is kind of cool. Um, so not just a free ring or a free vector space, but also a free category. It's pretty good. For fields, as I said before, you need to be a little bit more sophisticated. It's not quite what you think it is, not the one to set but the one to domain works. So a field is a domain, sure, by my definition, as well as a forgetful factor, where I forget that it is actually a field. And the field of fractions is the adjoint. So if you want, um, this is kind of the way how you construct Q, Q from Z, because kind of the field of fractions, so Q goes to Q anyway. So the field of fractions from, uh, so the, the field of fractions of Z is Q, huh? right? And that's kind of a general procedure. And as soon as you accept that, you actually get the notion of a free field. It's just not to set. It's just already built on the domain like the integers. So you can do that. Scalar extensions, so the next bullet point, is also uh, R and C are just randomly taken here. Or you can take any, any reasonable fields that are just extensions of one another. So you can forget, if you have C vector space, you can forget the C structure and just say it's an R vector space, just double the dimension. And it has a. Uh, 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 factors the other way around, which is the left adjoint. So it's a scalar extension. And sometimes the scalar extension is again a free construction if you want. And there are several other things that you can do. So you can forget that you have a polynomial ring construction. Um, the tensor homo junction that I've just mentioned, the currying, it's just a special form of this currying. So if you like tensor products, you can play the same game. Um, you could do things that are not really related anymore to free or forget. Uh, so from ring to group, you could take the uh, group of units, right? Every group has a unit, 
uh, every ring has a unit built inside to taking the, the invertible elements. And you can go backwards taking the group ring, which again kind of explains why those structures appear kind of everywhere in mathematics, because they really come from the theory of adjoint functors. So they behave very similar to forget and free. So in some sense, uh, the group ring is the free way to assigning a ring to a group if you want. Um, and another example would be from abelian to group. So you have the inclusion and the abelianization. Again, the abelianization is kind of the free way to assign it. You know how it works. Um, anyway, and kind of every, if that is not convincing, convincing enough and you don't believe my many more than actually any equivalence. So if you watch the previous video on adjoints where I try to motivate adjoints by generalizing equivalences, then the last, the well, not quite the last. The second two last bullet points shouldn't come as a huge surprise because every equivalence, of course, also an adjoint pair. But there's a huge list of these things. It's really, really beautiful. A huge list. And it doesn't stop there. So I really want to go to my cobaltism example because I really like it. So remember, I have my category one cop where the natural numbers are just the objects, so three, five, one, for example, and these cobaltism pictures are just the arrows or whatever. And you can stack them, very nice. And well, I can't explain it right now because there are too many words, a mouthful, but there's a certain type of category, the category of pivotal symmetric monoidal categories, whatever that means. Um, um, but we'll explain that in a later video, so um, be prepared. <laughs> but for now, it's just a certain type of category, which actually appears in topology, uh, pivotal symmetric monoidal categories. And the forgetful functor to, uh, well, to, to categories has a left adjoint and one cop arises in this way. So one cop is actually also a free object in the sense it's a, it's a free category in a certain sense. It's a free pivotal symmetric monoidal category generated by one object to be completely precise. Uh, okay, there's some crucial, of course, there's some crucial technicalities which I completely ignore here. So people might complain what I've just said, but. What I, what I said is uh, the in an adjoint pair here coming from the, this category one cop being the free pivotal symmetric monoidal category on uh, one generator. Okay, so it's also a free construction. So the the cobaltism category is also a free construction, which I think is a pretty cool statement uh, coming from adjoint functors. Although I can't right now explain the, the details. I hope the flavor is kind of clear kind of it's also a free type of construction, like a free vector space. Anyway, so um, adjoint uh, functors arise everywhere. The main example, the uh, free forget adjunction. I hope I got this in the correct order. So usually the left adjoint should be free and the right adjoint should be forget. Uh, if it's the other way around, then it's more co-free and forget. Whatever. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you believe by now that adjoints appear everywhere. And I also hope to see you next time.